Hi, Yuya. Oh, hi. <laughs> How are you? Very well. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. <laughs> King just ran past the office. I don't know what that means, but... Hmm? Oh, no, they have everything to... Uh, oh, there he is. <laughs> we're live and uh, ready to go. So, uh, thanks you for joining us. We are on day three of our workshop. Apologies for the awkward time. This was entirely my fault for no good reason. Thank you, Yulia, for joining us. And... Uh, Yulia will, uh, will tell us about uh, confinement and chiral symmetry breaking for the QCD like series with small T2. Yeah, so thank, thank you very much. For... Hmm? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to this wonderful workshop. So today I will talk about my ongoing unfinished work about some semi classical description of confinement for, for the QCD like theories with two torus type compactification. And uh, yeah, this is a plan of uh, my talk. So, so first uh, I will give some introduction. It's, yeah, I will give some introduction and why, why doesn't it? Uh, so, mm. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so yeah, so first uh, I will, review about some uh, property of four-dimensional confinement of four-dimensional gauge theory. And uh, I will review some scenarios of uh, confinement. Uh, one of uh, two famous scenarios, one of them is monopole condensation and the uh, other one is center vortex type scenario. And uh, yeah, in 4D case, uh, both scenarios uh, does not accept semi-classical description of confinement because of some uh, difficulty. But in certain cases, like three, for example, S1 compactification, monopole condensation can give a good semi-classical de description of confinement. So I want to talk about it very briefly. And after that, I will want to propose that the center vortex scenario is also, can also be a good candidate of semi-classical description of confinement if we perform two torus compactification with the first flux inserted. And uh, in the main part, uh, I will, uh, yeah, I want to argue that this two torus compactification with two fifth flux has very nice property, like uh, zero form center or one form center symmetry, both are unbroken. And uh, from the viewpoint of anomaly, this suggests us this is uh, give some fractionalization of the theta angle for the vacuum. And if we further introduce fermion, this likely gives some. Uh, as, yeah, some analog of chiral symmetry breaking in two-dimensional compactifier theory. So, so this kind of two-dimensional two uh, two torus compactification may give some good connection between uh, confinement and chiral symmetry property of 2D and confinement and chiral symmetry breaking in 4D. So let me go into introduction very slowly. So yeah, here I want to talk about four-dimensional Yamil theory. So this is the action. And uh, yeah, and uh, this is, and uh, here I only concentrate on SU and gauge, field, gauge theory, but um, I believe that uh, many things can be generated uh, arbitrary gauge theory. And uh, this is a basic uh, or fundamental theory of describing the strong forces. And uh, so, so important property of this uh, S N Yamil theory in four dimension is the confinement between of the test particles. So that means that so yeah, it is not a local ob local operator. But if we insert a test particle of, for example, representation R and some conjugate representation, and let's separate them. So let's change the distances in between them then interparticle potential is proportional to length. Or in other words, if we calculate the forces that fills this test quark due to this antiparticle, then this 
uh, confinement for this forces in between them is very is constant at any length if this length is sufficiently large. And in order to detect it in the language of gauge uh, field theory, then what we should introduce is a Wilson loop operator, so this quantity. And Wilson loop is um, yeah a loop operator, so it is not a local object. But uh, yeah, by introducing this loop operator, then we can practically introduce test quark and anti-test quark. And uh, by computing the expectation value of the Wilson loop then this uh, uh, confinement forces sigma r can be computed as an exponent of the area law of this Wilson loop. And so, and in Monte, for example, in Monte Carlo simulation, we already nicely see that this Wilson loop uh, nicely, so by numerical simulation, indeed in four dimensional Yamil theory, Wilson loop obeys area law. And because of that, uh, we believe that uh, this four dimensional gauge theory really shows confinement. So this is very nice, but the problem is there is some or do we have some intuitive understanding of this, of this confinement, confinement mechanism? And uh, there are two, two popular candidates for this, and uh, I want to talk about it. And, and the first one is a monopole condensation, and the other one would be center vortex percolation. And uh, I think monopole condensation is uh, uh, easier to understand. So let me start with monopole condensation. So monopole condensation is uh, just, so we should consider magnetic charged particle in three plus one dimension. And, and if we have, uh, if we, we have this kind of state, so, so this is a spa three space time, this is three space and we cut uh, some spatial slice. Then if this magnetic charged particle are uh, uh, freely uh, created in, in the vacuum, then if we introduce this kind of electric test particle, then electric flux emitted from this test particle should be correlated because, uh, because it's a dual of the Meissner effect. So in the case of superconductivity, we have a condensation of the electric particle. And if we want to, in, uh, introduce magnetic field, so superconductivity would like to repel that magnetic field. And uh, very similarly, if we introduce electric field inside the magnetic condensing system, then electric flux, uh, in, uh, ex, uh, uh, electric flux emitted from a test particle should would want to core correlate inside a very small area uh, spanning the Wilson loop. And because of this uh, uh, correlation of the electric flux, uh, so confining string is form formulate, formatted. And in the case of SUN gauge theory, so we usually take uh, maximal Abelian gauge. So taking the maximal uh, Abelian subgroup, you want to the N minus one of SUN. And we claim that electric charge mu is uh, belongs to the weight lattice, which is uh, uh, isomorphic to uh, integer to the n minus one. But but um, they, but uh, this uh, proportional factor is very important to, to discuss uh, with what kind of mon monopole charges are really condensing. And in order to see this, then we have to assign what is a possible magnetic charges, and um, after consideration of the Dirac quantization, we know that this magnetic charge must be living in the root lattice. Uh, so it is also pro uh, isomorphic to integer to the n minus one, but the proportional factor is different between weight lattice and root lattice. And this is very important because if we have a genuine particle, magnetic excitation and electric excitation, and if we circulate electric particle around the magnetic loop, magnetic particle, then a Haronov bone phase should be equal to one in order not to see the uh, Dirac string emitted uh, attaching to the uh, magnetic monopole. In, otherwise, this monopole cannot be a genuine particle. And because of this quantization, if we could can introduce a fundamental quark, test quark, then that kind of magnetic 
particle like excitation of this SU and gauge theory must live in the root lattice. And there should be a uh, tri trivial, uh, I don't know, bone phase between them. But, uh, but when this, uh, these magnetic monopoles are condensing, then yeah, any kind of electric Wilson loop shows area law. So this is the idea of the monopole condensation to explain confinement of SU and gauge theory. And uh, there is uh, something similar but very different scenario for the uh, confinement. And that is a center vortex confinement scenario. And that center vortex is a, a magnetically charged string type excitation. So here, monopole are particle like excitation, but the center vortex is a string type excitation. And uh, defining property of the center vortex is so if we have center vortex and also test electric particle, and if we uh, move this electric particle around this string excitation, then so there should be a non-trivial uh, mutual statistic e to of the two pi i over n, which is a minimal factor of the uh, center element of the SU N gauge group. And uh, so this is a space-like picture. So, so, oh, so this is a defining property of the center vortex in the space-time picture and uh, a sp space-like picture. And if we consider space-time picture, then this move or this move of the electric particle is nothing but the Wilson loop. And if this Wilson loop and uh, center vortex has a non-trivial linking, then compared with a uh, trivial linking between uh, center vortex surface and the Wilson loop, then there is a, a phase factor difference by center element E of D to pi I over N. So that means that, so if, so this means that, the, so if we consider a, a very large fluctuation of the uh, center vortex. So if center vortex can be excited, so sufficiently large center vortex can be excited, then phase factor of the e, uh, Wilson loop can be fluctuated because uh, there are many uh, uh, center vortex world state excitation that is linking or, or that is not linking. And depending on whether it links or it does not link, this phase factor appears or does not appear. So we have to sum up all poss those possibilities that fluctuate the phases of the Wilson loop. And this may, that fluctuation of the phases makes expectation value of the Wilson loop smaller and smaller. And consequently, it gives area law. So, 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 yeah, so what is common between a monopole condensing scenario and the center vortex scenario is that both, are, both important objects are some magnetically charged objects. But in the case of monopole, in the ca case of monopole condensing scenario, what is important is magnetically charged particle, and that has a trivial a mutual statistic between monopole and the electric particle. But if those particles are sufficiently randomly generated, then electric flux should be uh, correlated due to dual minus one effect. But in the case of center vortex, what is important is this kind of string-like excitation, and there is a non-trivial mutual statistics in between them. So compared with the monopole case, that is very different. But because of this phase fluctuation, so as in the case of the monopole condensing scenario, we also get the area row behavior. Of, so we can also expect the area row behavior of the Wilson loop expectation value. Okay. So now let me discuss whether we can achieve semi classical description of the confinement okay. using this kind of. A... Could, could I ask a question actually? Um, ah yes, yes, of course. Um, is this um is this object the same as the charge operator that measures the charge of the one form center symmetry? Uh, this center vortex, yeah. Also, basically, it, it's the same same object, but the difference is in the case of the center symmetry generator, we also we have to insert that operator by hand. But the center vortex scenario is the claim that such kind of object. Uh, 
dynamically generated effectively at the low energies. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, this kind of commutation relation can be really understood by, by regarding that this object is just a low energy realization of the uh, center symmetry generator. I see, great, thank you. So I should imagine there's some tension on this thing as well, in addition to the, the topological part, is that correct? Uh, yeah, so it has non-trivial tension and this makes uh, very, so, yeah, very difficult to, to read this kind of scenario semi-classically. In semi-classics, it would have a finite tension. Okay, excellent, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so now, so I want to discuss whether this kind of scenario, monopole condensation or center vortex is useful to understand the confinement semi-classically. So as an intuitive picture, both scenarios are very useful or give some explanation to understand how confinement really occurs. But, uh, but in order to convince ourselves that this really occurs, then we, it is good that we have a nice analytic control to treat those excitation. But unfortunately, in the case of 4D, in the case of 4D, so uh, we know that both, uh, so both monopole or center vortex excitation are not good as, uh, um, as a semi classical for semi classical treatment. So basically, because uh, so so in 4D monopole is a loop kind excitation. So what I have drawn here is just a 3D special cut, cut slice of four dimensional space time. But uh, in reality, this is just a cut of the, so this point of the magnetic particle is just a cutted cut of the line operator and uh, line type ex excitation in space time. So monopole is indeed a loop in four dimensional space time. And similarly, I draw a line for the center vortex in spatial picture, but the center vortex is actually a surface in four dimensional space time. And in order to treat those excitation or in order to proliferate those excitation in four dimension, so, so very large loop or surfaces have to be created. But uh, in order to, for such creation of the large loop or space surfaces, the energy density of those loop or surfaces must be very small compared with the possible entropy factor. And in weak coupling, this energy density is typically one over G squared, so coupling constant square. So in weak coupling, this energy density tends to be very, very large. So ten tension of the line or string uh, or surface is very, very large. But the entropy factor is just a geometric, ge geometric thing in, of the loop or surface. So we expect that it is independent of the coupling constant. So it is always uh, on order one quantity. But so, yes. I, I don't understand your inequality because it's not dimensionally correct. So, so usually I think of energy density being less than the temperature to some power. Uh, right, yeah. Zero. So what, what's, what's the relevant scale on the right hand side? Um, let's see. So, so here, what we really computing is, uh, let's see. So what we really compute is so we compute when we computing energy density. Let's, yeah, when we compute energy density, so it is for example in for example in lattice model. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I think what I am writing here. So, so when I'm writing here, I'm making everything dimensionless, let's use, considering the lattice. So everything is made dimensionless, I think, by lattice scale, lattice, lattice constant. And so for example, this energy density is basically computed by magnetic Coulomb interaction of the, for example, of a, a loop, a monopole loop, and the short distance part of the uh, that the Coulomb interaction cannot be screened by other 
as a monopole loop. So that, that part, so that short range part of the Coulomb would be a genuine energy density factor. And the entropy factor is just, a, so when we consider a loop of length L, then so, so we, we just want to compute non-self uh, interact, uh, intersecting lines. So when we go from go to up, then there are seven possible directions on, the, for example, on the hypercubic lattice of four dimension. Then this entropy factor is, for example, just log seven or something. There, so a, I think everything is made dimensionless by uh, a lattice constant in that So case. there's an explicit UV cutoff on the left hand. Yeah, right, right. And when, when, when lattice spacing A gets taken to zero, it, is it never possible to satisfy this inequality? Does that always push up the energy density so high that? Uh, no, so, so for example, when we consider lattice strong coupling, then yeah, it is possible to achieve this inequality, but uh, yeah, but uh, anyway, it is difficult to treat everything semi-classically, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for question. Sorry, you, uh, just a follow-up question. Is the inequality supposed to just signify that you basically, when you have a semi-classical object of certain dimension, then you have competition of its fluctuating versus the yep. weight that you need to take? Is this? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. So, this is so the content of the... Right, this entropy factor is how, so, yeah, so how loop can fluctuate something like this. And, and on, on each, yeah, so, so basically in this case, it is log seven or something. And this energy density is really just a short range, yeah, basically just a short range Coulomb interaction on the lattice, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so unfortunately, so, so point is in the weak coupling, this kind of magnetic type excitation, so this energy density is computed from a classical action. So this, this one is, should, is just a computation GF mu nu squared on very specific configuration having a loop type excitation or surface type excitation. Then, so this is typically just one over G squared, but the interview factor is just order one. So this uh, wanted inequality is opposite, unfortunately, in the weak coupling regime. Then this tends to say that the, so entropy factor cannot win. So only very small loop or surfaces can be created. But in such a situation, for example, in the case of monopole, plus monopole and minus, uh, positive monopole and minus monopole are very, it means that small loop means only very, so th these monopole uh, should form a bound state with neutral magnetic charge. Then electric flux can, uh, so then such vacuum is very transparent for electric field. So effectively, Coulomb, uh, so effective interaction between quark and anti-quark is just a Coulomb type interaction. And the, or any charges are basically deconfined in such a weak coupling regime. Yeah, but the situation becomes better in the case of 3D. Then in 3D, monopole becomes an instant because of the one-dimensional compactification. So monopole is basically just a point of the space-time. And the vortex is still a loop. And, and because the vortex is still a loop in three dimension, so this center vortex uh, confinement scenario is not still uh, so semi it's not still useful for semi-classical discussion of the confinement, but the monopole can be useful. And indeed, so by proliferation of the monopole instantons, semi-classical description of the confinement can be available so, uh, as shown by, for example, Polyakov. And uh, this is, but this is shown only for gen genuine 3D, 3D gauge theories. But um, so, but nowadays, so if we not, so although it is not a pure Yamu theory, but at least if we add some number of the adjoint fermion with four-dimensional Yamu theory, 
then considering the S1 compactification to obtain a three-dimensional three effective theory, then taking the periodic boundary condition for the adjoint fermions, then so that theory becomes effectively three-dimensional confining theory as shown by, for example, Mithat Unzar in to, since 2007. So if we consider uh, S1 compactification with suitable setup, then this monopole condensation scenario is a good, uh, semi provides us a nice semi-classical description of the confinement. So, so it is a kind of the a very semi-classical explicit realization of the monopole condensing scenario in that case. Um, excuse me, may I interrupt with a question? Um, of course, of course. So if I understand correctly, um, you are emphasizing the semi-classical nature of the explanation, because if you go to a 4D compact U1 lattice gauge theory, there is a rigorous definition of a monopole field, and yes, it indeed yes. condenses in the confined phase and not in the Coulomb phase, of course. So there right. is monopole confinement, monopole condensation driving confinement in four-dimensional U1 gauge theories, but it's not a semi-classical effect. Yeah, I completely agree. Right, right. And in the case of, yeah, for example, yeah, lattice U1 compact U1 gauge theory, or yeah, or for example, hypercubic lattice, then if we consider very strong coupling regime, then there is a nice S duality between weak coupling and strong coupling at, in some suitable setup. Then, yeah, we can indeed show that monopole condensation should occur in such regime. But the pro point is, it is not useful as a semi for semi classical description. Yeah, right. So mm -hmm. that that is the point. point. Yeah, so yeah, it, I really like those scenarios, but uh, I, I, I'm just saying that it's not useful for semi classical. So that's true. Okay, and now idea is, uh, or a question I want to ask is, so is there some way to realize this center vortex confining scenario using as a semi classical description? So, so, so far in my understanding, Semi-classical uh, center vortex scenario can be, for example, tested using lattice numerical simulation, and so and it is, not, for, for example, gives us a nice explanation of the NRT rule of the asymptotic string tension. But um, but unfortunately, it is not. So, so it seems that so semi-classical description using center vortex confinement scenario is not still there. So. So question I want to answer is whether there is uh, some nice situation with a uh, center vortex confinement scenario is really uh, available. And the idea is, uh, yeah, so monopole, be so, so usefulness of the monopole in 3D is monopole is a point like excitation in 3D. So naive idea is in 2D, vortex is a point. So can't we get a new semi-classical confinement of 4D Yamiya theory by considering two total compactification? Then eventually we should get two-dimensional effective gauge theory and maybe their center vortex is a nice explanation of semi-classical confinement. Right, so so far I give some quick introduction and in order to skip some time, I already draw uh, have written introduction part, but uh, from now in, I want to slow down and I want to give some more detailed explanation of this idea by very lively. So from now I want to consider two torus compactification. So our space time is, so I want to consider four dimensional gauge theory. So our space time is some, some four dimensional, but we consider something large M. So, so some large two dimension times very small torus, small T2. And uh, we want to consider uh, we want to consider a two-dimensional effective 
gauge theory here. Yeah. And uh, so, and the goal is uh, I want to describe confinement of this two-dimensional effective theory using center vortices and in a suitable setup of this two torus compactification. And I want to argue that many interesting physics of four dimension can be encoded into this two-dimensional effective theory. Yuya? Yes. Sorry, M may I interrupt just before you go into this? Uh, so you want to compactify the theory somehow to 2D. Uh, yes, yes. Then uh, see whether these center vortices induce confinement or something interesting. However, right. what I'm a little bit confused is if you have a 2D gauge theory, confinement is kind of natural. So, um, uh, so point, yeah, yeah. So I want to give some explanation, but uh, so point is, so I want to make that confinement uh, is some something similar to the confinement of the four dimension. And if we naively compactify, then we get the pure two-dimensional SU and gauge theory without basically Higgs field. Then in such regime, indeed, the confinement is very natural. It's just a, uh, because in two-dimensional Coulomb law is already linear confinement. But in such naive two-dimensional compactification, where confinement is very natural, then yeah, for example, if we pay attention to the theta angle dynamics, then theta angle in 2D YAMUs is not present. So there is no theta angle dependence. But if we consider a two torus compactification with the fifth flux, then theta angle dependence of the vacuum becomes fractionalizes. But at the same time, Polyakov loop or so loop operator inside this small torus provides some adjoint Higgs field. With non zero, non, non zero bev. And because, and after that, so all, for example, so gauge, effective gauge field in this large two dimension becomes very massive because of the Higgs effect and uh, confinement of such a in Higgs, deep Higgs regime is somewhat become somewhat non trivial. But, uh, but and indeed, at the reading classical level, uh, Wilson loop inside this large M2 seems to show perimeter law. But uh, due to the ex uh, vortex type excitation, so area law of the confinement uh, reappears, and those center vortex excitation is really a key to understand the fractionalization of the theta angle. Yeah, yeah, so let, let me go into detail. I, I will talk about it very soon. So, so yeah, so before that, uh, I want to uh, first, so before introducing the uh, to first flux, let me start with a naive T2 compactification. So that is, that means I do not insert any to first flux. Then, so since we have small T2, Then, for, for example, let me say these two directions are third and fourth direction. Then Yam is theory, so in 4D, now contains, uh, so in this two, F3, 4 of DX3, DX. So it contains this factor. And so, and, and in order to minimize this quantity, so, so we want to set F34 wants to zero because this is very small T2. So classical analysis will, would be uh, valid for these third and fourth directions. And basically, so, so that means that, the, so, so effective, so there is no uh, gauge, gauge field in this three and four direction effectively and effective dynamics is captured by a Polyakov loop around this third direction and also fourth direction.
and uh, this trivial trivial F three four and uh, uh, absence of any top flux says that so P three four P four are independent of X three X four. So they 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 have trivial zero mode, and furthermore P three and P four commute with each other. So so these P three P four that means that P three and P four are simultaneously diagonalizable. And so, and at the classical level, this is everything. But uh, for example, considering the one loop effective action, so it's, for example, a gross Pisarski Yaffe type effective potential. generates that so this effective of P3, P4 is basically having some factor and and and, and yeah. yeah something like this and and because of this negative sign, so so minima, min, so classical minima, yeah, for example, given by P3 and P4 are both proportional to the identity. So that means that so 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 gauge fields are very trivial. So so that means that so in other words, so you can really set A3 and A4 are just zero because of this expression. So, so by setting A3 and A4 are really trivial, then you can realize this one. And that means that so, so, so 2D effective theory would, would be just a pure 2D SUNR mills. And consequently, we get uh, and uh, and as the team suggest uh, pointed out, uh, so so confinement of the Wilson loop inside M two is uh, showing some uh, area row, something like this. So in some sense, uh, this is already confining. So 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 so. Or in other words, GN one form symmetry in 2D is unbroken in modern terminology. But what is bad is so because of these P3 and P4, so 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 GN so zero form center symmetry is broken. And uh, one ad another bad thing is uh, so 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 property of a trivial thing is so so uh, so let me summarize so, so trivial compactification. So summary for trivial T two is so first G N one form symmetry in four D is now split to GN zero form times GN zero form symmetry acting on P3 and P4 and uh, remnant of GN one form symmetry in 2D acting to Wilson loop. And the point is GN zero times GN zero one form symmetry is broken and the GN one form is unbroken. And uh, another remarkable feature is uh, so 2D theta angle for pure SUN is absent. Although, and uh, this, this has sharp contrast with the fact that 4D theta has uh, 
non-trivial affect non-trivial dynamics, confining dynamics of SUN. So this is the situation for trivial SU, so trivial compactification of two-dimensional SUN. So in this case, yeah, so confinement of GN1 form symmetry is very trivial just because of the Coulomb interaction and there is no role of the center vortices. And, and just zero form center symmetry due, appearing due to compactification is uh, spontaneously broken. So that, that is the situation of trivial compactification. So, so now let me consider a T2 compactification. with two hoofed flags. So, so let me draw T2. And in order to give some explicit ex explanation, let me just consider T2 as just a three by three lattice. And, and here, let me introduce a tofu to flux. And, and the insertion of the tofu to flux is in the case, case of Wilson lattice. So, so one over, so, so we have a bracket and one minus one over n here part of three. So. So, so U bracket is uh, this, uh, U, UP refers a uh, uh, multiplication of the link variable along each bracket. And uh, this is uh, basically Wilson, Wilson lattice action. But with insertion of the two foot flux, so we replace this action as one over n times real part of E of I. BP. So, so this BP takes uh, a value of GN phases to pi over n to pi over n times two. And so, so some bracket gauge field is introduced and it is multiplied to this uh, uh, to this uh, Wilson part, Wilson action part. And if we pay attention to this, then so trace of UP, so, so we have to, so in classical limit, we want to maximize trace of UP in the case of the Wilson action. But here, since we are multiplying the Tofufto flux, what we have to multiply try uh, maximize is this combination. And, and uh, let me divide by one over n. And, 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 and you want to achieve, and if possible, you want to achieve this is equal to one everywhere. And this is, and this is in, indeed possible. So if we insert the two pi i over n times trace over say this one as one, two, three, four. So you want to say that you one times you two. Want to n, uh, so for you. So one. So, so you want to ask whether this kind of use uh, really exists. And it, yes, it indeed exists. So if we consider, so you one, equal U3 inverse as a shift operator. It is taking something like this uh, up to some phase. And U2 and U2 inverse as a clock operator, which is one omega. With omega is E over two pi i over N. Then, so this, matrices has uh, this Wilson-Tufruit type commutation relation. 
And because of this, if we into the, so if we substitute this configuration into this expression, you can check that it is indeed one. And going back to the lattice picture, yeah. So by just saying that these link variable are or, or shift matrices, and by saying that this link variable are all clock matrices, then only here you get a non-trivial bracket of bracket action, uh, e, e of minus two pi i over n, which is canceled by this uh, explicit insertion of the fifth flux to maximize uh, uh, Wilson, uh, Wilson lattice action. But for other part, for example, like this, then trace of UP is just a trace of S times S inverse, uh, in multiplying in that along this direction, and it is equal to one. So basically, even after inserting the fifth flux, you can realize a flat connection and but, but the point is each link variable is now non-trivial compared with the case of the uh, trivial to, to, torus compactification. And indeed, so if we consider, so let, let me call this direction is fourth direction and this direction is third direction. Then Polyakov loop around, along third direction is basically proportional to this shift matrices due to this S. And P4, so Toriakov group along the fourth direction is now a clock matrices. And, and let me, con and now from 4D, we perform 2D compact, uh, two torus compactification and we get the effective for, uh, 2D theory. And now as in the case of the uh, trivial compactification, GN symmetry, GN one form symmetry in 4D is now split into one form symmetry, GN one form symmetry in 2D times GN zero form times GN zero form symmetry. And importantly, now these zero form center symmetry are unbroken, basically because if we compute trace of P3, then this is trace of S, and this is equal to zero. So all the parameter of Z and zero form symmetry is trivial, and the same is true for P4. And if if we if we if you play with some algebra, so you can we can indeed check the trace of P3 and P4 and P3. So, so, a, so any this kind of operator becomes zero unless uh, it is trivial. Uh, so, whenever it is trivial under Gn zero form symmetry times Gn zero form symmetry. So you can indeed check that this Gn zero form symmetry is unbroken. But the price you pay is so so now unbroken Gn one form symmetry becomes non-trivial. Basically, because these P3 and P4 act as a Higgs field, so so effective Lagrangian of 2D is, is looks like something like this. So F12 square plus uh, uh, let's say D1 of P3. So or So this kind of, uh, so Higgs coupling, Higgs A1 
its coupling appears and, and basically because these P3 and P4 are act, uh, appear as an adjoint, uh, as a adjoint Higgs field. And with, with this P3 and P4, we can prove that all massless uh, or all, all components of gauge field now become massive due to adjoint fixing. So if we only have one adjoint uh, X field, then we can maximally break SUN to the U1 to the N minus one. But uh, since now we have two adjoint X field with uh, non-trivial uh, commutation relation, then all gauge field, not only so not only of diagonal component, including Cartan components, so we can make all gauge field um, now massive. Then classically, by Higgs mechanism. So if we compute Wilson loop in 2D, then since all gauge fields are massive, it seems that it is proportional to one or seems to be a perimeter law at very naively. So now, um, so now GN one form symmetry seems to be broken. And it seems to be bad, yeah. So I want to resolve this problem using the center vortices. Can you ask a question, Yuyun? Yes, yes. So, so in order to put, there's an echo from the other rooms <laughs> where my voice is coming back to me. Um, <laughs> in order to put um, the, the top flux through, you, you went via the lattice. Which, which, yes. struck, which, which struck me as a little odd because you were dealing with the continuum field theory until then. You yeah, could, right. P3 but... commutator P4 is, is the phase e to the 2 pi i over n. And, and then got to the to the S and C equations immediately, is that right? Yes, exactly, exactly. So even in continuum, so basically, yeah, as you pointed out, important thing is P3 and P4 uh, non-commuting something like this. And this phase, so at least in the case of the flat connection, this phase is really nothing but the um, top of the flux. So that, that's the definition of the top flux. And, and if I go back to the gross pizarski yaffe uh, effective potential, and I plug in those eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. If I go back to, yeah, exactly, your effective potential, but it, is this a local minima or is it just a completely decoupled sector because the top flux is, can't be removed? Yeah, I'm not completely sure. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure whether someone has computed this kind of GPY effective potential with two torus compactification, including Tofufto flux. So without Tofufto flux, so we already know that at least by so at the classical level, P3 and P4 are commuting. And when computing this kind of effective potential, so ordering of P3 and P4 are not important at all. But uh, as we know from this classical computation, P3 and P4 com has a non-trivial commutation relation up due to this phase. And uh, I'm not sure whether someone has computed this kind of GPY effective potential, knowing that this P3 and P4 are really non-commuting. I see. So th this is um, th this is an effective potential, potential really for the eigenvalues of P3 and P4. So right, right, right. So, yeah, I, I think we have to solve the classical part first and uh, identify the this identify whether P3 and P4 are commuting or non-commuting. And next, at the next day, we have to perform, I think, one root type computation. So 
Do you have a flat moduli space? Hmm? Do you have a flat moduli space in the presence of a top flux? Uh, with the first flux, no, no. So all moduli space are lifted uh, due, due to this. Uh, yeah, maybe so there's no potential to compute in some this, sense. This uh, Higgs gauge field coupling. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Can I, can I ask a follow up question? question? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, are you worried at all that uh, computing the GPY potential could uh, change something? I mean, I understand that this is the leading term, it's classical. But right. I remember something about the Eguchi Kawai story where they tried to use these tooth fluxes and there were some problems. Um, yeah, that's true. And uh, yeah, so to be honest, I'm not completely sure. So the problem of twisted Eguchi ka so, ka Kawai by numerical practice simulation is the case of, I think, one cubic model or uh, yeah, one cubic lattice model. So, so at least, uh, yeah, so volume independence, large end volume independence with a uh, twisted Eguchi-Kawai scenario seems not to work, uh, and work at least for the one cubic, hyper cubic model. But uh, I'm not sure whether it is really a problem in multiple cubic case. Mm -hmm. And even in one cubic case, uh, so at least when we take some nice prime number, which is order of root of n, and inserting a topic flux with proportional uh, of order of p and q, then Eguchi Kawai reduction, twisted Eguchi Kawai reduction seems to work. So, so may, maybe this naive minimal topic flux insertion may not work, but still I hope that something similar should work by choosing clever to move the flux. I never understood the, the statement. I just remembered that somehow it, it didn't work. Uh, but uh, uh, naively, it doesn't look like uh, the one loop can change the classical result. But OK, thank you. Yeah, so very naively, yeah, because uh, at least uh, in UV analysis, I think this coupling constant can give an um, ordering of the effective Lagrangian. So, and it is, I, I think it's at least in the weak coupling limit, it seems natural that we have, we first minimize classical term, then one loop part, part is uh, one G squared suppressed. So it would not affect very significantly. That's a naive guess, but uh, yeah. But I, I'm not completely sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, may I also ask something? Um, oh, of course. You, you uh, compactify from four dimensions, but at the end you work in two dimensions, which mm -hmm. uh, is, of course, far away from four dimensions. So, um, of course, the, by starting in 4D, I imagine that you uh, end up with models like the one that you discussed at the end, which you would not have just written down a priori as 2D quantum field theories. But so therefore, I guess that this compactification is a nice way of getting interesting 2D models. But are you finally hoping ho to learn something about 4D itself? Um, yeah, that's uh, minor goal, but. Uh... But he, 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 here, I just want to yeah, get a nice 2D model, which is, uh, so for example, theta dynamics, chiral symmetry mm -hmm. property are similar to 4D. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And the uh, final goal is, uh, or, or very nice optimistic scenario is that, that uh, 2D understanding is continuously connected to 4D confining dynamics, but uh, that, that yeah. is still too far, yeah, yeah. That is a bit too optimistic, yeah. uh, I would say. I mean, a very long time ago, Martin Lüscher had a similar uh, starting point when he studied Yang Mills theory in a small volume, which was uh, small in all spatial directions. And uh, then uh, Pierre van Baal uh, and others worked out the spectrum of that theory 
And then uh, they were hoping to make the extent of the spatial directions bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. But then the system essentially goes through a, through a phase transition. So uh, there were drastic uh, qualitative changes between the compactified and the large world. Yeah. Yeah, that's also, yeah, that's also possible, but uh, at least, uh, so what I'm going to tell is uh, if this ZN1 form symmetry, which seems to be broken, is actually unbroken due to center vortex, vortex con semi-classical confinement, then, so we will, we will see that, for example, fractionalization of the theta angle, back, so theta angle on each vacuum is really realized and uh, fermionic zero mode, for example, including fundamental fermion is, uh, seems to match with a uh, chiral symmetry breaking due to center vortex. Yeah, so, okay. so, so up to this point, that's everything I can tell. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, whether it is really connected is the uh, ne next, should be next project, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, but the same, thanks very much for coming. Yeah, yeah, Okay. Okay, let's see. So, okay, so this, so it seems that GN1 form symmetry seems to be broken at the classical level. Oh, but um, there is some rule that, for example, in quantum mechanics, so zero form symmetry is not, cannot be broken. Or, or even if it is broken at, at the classical level. Then, so instanton or, or quantum, so or semi-classical or instanton calculation should be performed. And uh, it says that uh, so at the quantum level, so symmetry is restored. And if we believe this, or, or yeah, we indeed know that it is not always true, true. for example, when the anomaly of quantum mechanics is really present, but um, very naively without very such sophisticated reason, we usually believe that the uh, classical or symmetry of the classical Lagrangian should be restored at the quantum level, even if each classical vacuum, vacuum breaks it. And um, so similarly, so it is, so in 2D QFT, so we believe that unless there is a nice or sophisticated reasoning without such as the first anomaly, one home symmetry is not spontaneously broken. And the idea is, let's, for example, consider 2D U1 gauge Higgs model. And we consider that, so Lagrangian is something like And let's add some Higgs field with the charge N, for example. And uh, let's add some wine bottle potential, something like this. Yeah, and uh, we can also add set of terms here. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and this gauge Higgs model is uh, literally very similar to this uh, uh, to this situation, so to the compactification of the uh, four dimensional Yamil with the fifth flat. So, this, this part, so by saying that this uh, classical potential or bosonic potential equal to zero, then uh, naively we can say that uh, so magnitude of phi is equal to some vacuum expectation value. Then, then we can say that. Oh, we can say that. So phi is roughly B of E of I phi at low energy. 
then effective Lagrangian is something like this plus v square of round mu plus n a mu plus del mu phi i equal. Oh, so this is basically an effective potential or, if, or effective Lagrangian at low energy. Then by solving this part of the equation of motion, it tells you that so basically a mu, so gauge field is almost flat. So, or in other words, f is a derivative of, of a, so it is give, given by zero. So if we, so, so having this classical vacua, then if we compute Wilson loop, which is just this, then, so it is so it is just a computation of the field strength of the area uh, around inside the inside uh, spanned by C. And this is just equal to one. So we get perimeter row. So at the classical level, again, it seems that so one form symmetry. Of acting on the fifth uh, or acting on Wilson loop is seems to be spontaneously broken, also for this two dimensional U1 gauge Higgs model. But uh, we also have a vortex configuration. So we have a vortex. And around here, so phi rotates to phi plus two pi. And inside this vortex, uh, there is a, so at the center of the vortex, phi goes to zero and the field strength uh, is now non-vanishing. And indeed, in, in this case, if we compute F of this, uh, of this reach of this vortex, then it should be computed at the sufficient large S1 of A. So we should compute the, we can just compute uh, contour integral of A. And since it is given by, well, so, so when, when we consider a space time point, which is sufficiently far of the vortex, then this classical equation, A equal one over N times T phi should be a good approximation. So we can compute it. And since phi is changed by phi plus two pi, we get two pi over. So integration of, of f, uh, so field strength is should be non-trivial. And uh, in order for this equation to be true, f, have, f inside vortex have to be non-zero. And if there are many, many, and so, 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 so we can now compute the vortex amplitude. as E of minus S classical action of the vortex. And since integration of F is one over N times two pi, then it has a non-trivial theta dependence here. So it has I theta over N, something like this. Then performing dilute vortex gas approximation, So we can compute energy inside, so ground state energy of this vortex, and you get uh, something like E over minus S vortex times one minus cosine theta over N. So this is a, so, so this is a theta dependence of the 2D uh, gauge, gauge, U1 gauge Higgs model. And, and knowing this expression, then computation of the Wilson loop is the compute. So that means, so inside, so we can introduce Wilson loop like this. Then, so here we have a set of terms here, but uh, so now rewriting this Wilson loop or as E of one over two pi, sorry, so, it is loop integral of A, 
and uh, you can write this as a 2 pi over 2 pi times Ta of D inside this loop. And so, and this is a shift of the theta term. So theta term inside is shifted by theta plus two pi. And so now we can say that this is the area times E of theta plus two pi minus E of theta. And with this a fractional theta, theta dependence of the cosine part, this is obviously non-zero. And this means that so Wilson loop or the N0 one form symmetry is restored due to vortex gas. Are you claiming that the cosine there is an exact result or just the result of the dilute vortex gas approximation? Uh, this is a result of the dilute vortex gas, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because often um, one finds that the periodic function there has cusps. So uh, like a parabola, which then uh, jumps from one branch to the next, you know what mm -hmm. I'm talking about, right? So I would not be surprised if the exact answer would have such features. Yeah, I see. Uh, but uh, I want to say that at least the cusp indeed is, so point is E of theta plus two pi is not equal to E of theta, although partition full part original partition function should satisfy this. Mm -hmm. So this says that, so Z of, so actual partition function with theta should be given by something like this, minus this time value of e of theta plus two plus k. Mm -hmm. And so, so if we plot ground state, real ground state energy, then let, let's say n is, for example, three, then we get, So this is one branch and this is six pi zero. And uh, we get two. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think you mm -hmm. now get the idea. But. So there is indeed a multi-branch structure. Mm -hmm. And this point is pi to pi, something like this. Uh -huh. I so see. there is indeed a phase transition at C pi, even okay. in this Direct gas approximation. Thank you. Yep, yep. Okay. And so, and the claim is so, or my expectation is the similar thing really occurs also for, so, so for the young mules with. It's uh, into with the top of the flux is inserted. And the point is so, so at, again, as a classical level, the N1 from symmetry seems to be broken. But now, what we consider is a center vortex. Can restore us, can restore our GN one form symmetry, which is broken at the classical level. And moreover, what is really interesting is, so now we have, uh, we are introducing the Tofufto flux, so, so surface of the B inside three and four direction. And uh, let's now assume that uh, we have a Tofufto, so we have a dynamically excited center vortex. Then at this intersection point, so at each intersection point, S topological of 4D amuse is now one over N. So if we consider a center vortex excitation, so, so, is as in the case of, uh, to the SUNYAMUSE, it is again 
some center vortex classical action. And again, we have a one over n times, so fractionalized theta dependence due to, of this center vortex amplitude in this setup. And this is uh, possible because we already introduced the uh, uh, to flux in along uh, compactified di direction. Then to uh, then center vortex excitation appearing in remnant large 2D direction is uh, has this uh, fractional theta dependence. So again, if we have this kind of uh, vortex, anti-vortex configuration, then each one has this kind of fractional theta dependence. And by performing the similar dilute gas approximation, so ground state energy of the theta is again given by S of minus three, one minus cosine theta over N in this semi-classical limit. Do you have a, a semi-classical solution for the center vortex? Um, I, so that part, I am not completely sure. But uh, so, so, but one comment is, so there is a nice paper by Yamazaki and Yonekura. And uh, what they consider is slightly different from my setup, but uh, what they consider is M4 is, so S1 times S1 times S1 times R. And these are large and these are small. And uh, my idea is introducing the Tofuft flux in for this small S1 cross S1. But what they consider is they introduce so non trivial to full flux between one of small S1 and one of large S1. And in this case, what they found is so effective 2D theory on S1 cross R. So, so this large S1 cross R is 2D CPN minus one C1 model on S1 cross R with, so what people call ZN twisted compactification. Not with, the, that, with the round metric? Hmm? With, with the Fabini study uh, metric? Uh, so, uh, so what, what is bad is SUN symmetry is now broken to GN cross GN. So, so it is not a Fubini study, but, but uh, it is a kind of a CPN minus one model with deformed metric. Yeah, yeah. So, so this, this one is different. So it's deformed. Yeah, so that, so, so. So PSUN rotation acting on CPN is now broken to GN cross GN. And these GNs are one form symmetry on these compactified S1 cross S1. Yeah, yeah. And in, in this case, so classically. You can also ask something? In your model, there are also the. Uh, monopoles with uh, the wall line wrapped around the toes, and you can also think of young means instantons. All of them look like 2D instantons, right? So, can right. You, can so, they contribute also to this uh, process of, of uh, restoration of the symmetry. Yeah, so what I'm expecting is so, yes, there are four dimensional instantons, and if that instanton size is larger than these T2 compactified direction, then what is what I'm hoping is those instanton has, of course, integer topological charge, but I think it with small T2 flux uh, compactification with the fifth flux, I so what I'm expecting is that instanton splits 
into n center vortices. So that is my expectation. At, at least topological charge matches. Yes. So at least so and similar thing happens on, for example, R3 cross S1 with non-trivial holonomy background. Then there, so for the instanton, if for the size of for the instanton is larger than compactified S1, then it splits into n monopole instanton vertices. vertices. So something, uh, so I'm expecting that something similar is also happening here. So the two instances that you see, can you tell if they come from for the vortices, for the monopoles, for the instantons, or the only Yeah, so I, I think by correct, correcting some of these, uh, so so I, so to the instanton is nothing but these center vortices, and by correcting uh, some combination of center vortices, uh, may, may, so I, I think we can reconstruct for the instant. Yeah, I, I'm not. I have not checked it, but that that is uh, my expectation. And uh, at, at least that is happening in in this setup. So classically. So what is happening is so Polyakov loop along large S1. So has has so n distinct vacua. So one e of two pi i over. N. So n classical vacua. So P is something like so, so something like this. And by having this instant on jump, this uh, n classical back, so 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 Gn zero form symmetry is now uh, classically broken, but by this instant on jump, it is now restored. And and this fractional instant on indeed has a, I over e of i over e of e to the i theta over n. So 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 this also has a correct uh, fractional topological charge. So at least so what I, I think this center vortex configuration is a two D type realization. If we of this instant on jump, if we make this S one cross S one is small. So S one cross S one is with to, to flux insertion is small. So, so I have not constructed the classical solution with actual this to the compactification setup, but at least in similar setup, there is a nice semi-classical understanding of this instant. And, and just to make sure I understand, there's um, the, the story you told that, you know, Metat has been pushing for a long time, that instantons, on a circle split into n monopoles, he called them bions, but monopoles. Exactly, on R3 cross S1, with no trivial Now the story for the CPN sigma model, where the CPN lump splits into n kinks. But, but you're saying that, that um, Yanazaki and Yonakura have discovered something different from that, that old story. It's, it's a novel way in which the lump splits up. Uh, or I can say that so Yamazaki and Yonekura make some explicit connection between that uh, instant on type. Uh, so, yeah, at, so let's, let me say different. So, for, for example, so what Mita had considered for, for the gauge theory is uh, S1 compactification with adjoint fermions. So, that uh, zero form center symmetry along that compactified direction is unbroken. Then with, non with that non-trivial holonomy background, as Fumber, Crown and Fumber and Li Lu has found, so, uh, so instant on splits into n monopole, inst monopole instant on, and they are uh, they play an important role of semi-classical confinement in that setup. And motivated by that, so if we so in 2D CPN minus one model. If we consider S1 compactification with a flavor twisted background, then yeah, very similar thing happens. And what Yamazaki and Yonekura has shown that that twisted CPN minus one model can be obtained from for the Yamu theory with this very specific compactification. Yeah. 
So it's partly related to uh, Mithat and uh, Gerald Dunn's work on Sigma model, but uh, it is not directly related to gauge theory side. But there's a calculation to be done, which is to find these sensible tech solutions in your model. Uh, so at least for this Yamazaki Onekura setup, so there's a ex very explicit, so a very explicit mapping from, for example, for the instanton to this CPN minus one instanton is indeed constructed. But uh, yeah, but uh, I, I'm not sure whether that mapping still is valid for this uh, to the compactify set or with the fifth flag. So if it's really true, then this set of the scenario seems to really work, yeah. But I have not checked that part yet, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, let's see. Yeah. Can I ask a, a, a quick question? Uh, okay. So, do we have any intuition what would happen if you took the um, picture of Mick Hutt and company in 3D and add a, now a 12th flux, compactify one of the directions and add a 12th flux now in the, in the first compactified direction and here. And I'm thinking of, there's this paper by Eric Popitz, Mohammed and Midhat where they were thermally compactifying that 3D story. But now if you yeah. put a hoofed flux, you can maybe see how this monopole confinement turns into your center vortex confinement. Do you have any I intuition? See. That, that maybe. Yeah, that's an interesting point, but uh, yeah, I do not have any intuition on it. Yeah. Because there's this. Yeah, uh, if we could understand that part, that's very promising about the, of this, for this scenario. But uh, yeah, I, I do not have a good intuition for it. In the Lattice community, people who, who, who look for monopoles and center vortices, there always seems to be a tension between them. Maybe you can make peace. Mm. between right. them say look it's the, really the same thing or something or at least give a relation between the two um right in the case of uh, lattice so what is say people are saying is so yeah so let's see yeah so as i have said so monopole has a trivial commutation with fundamental quark but uh, uh the fifth flag has non trivial commute, commutativity. And um, so that is basically saying that so if we have a monopole line, then if we start, if we further perform to the center vortex gauge, then there is something, right? So, so magnetic flux emitted from monopole is a generator of the center vortex surfaces. So, so, so that that would be a case of the lattice, for at least for the lattice. So something similar can be understood. Yeah, if we can understand something similar, that's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. I understand it's preliminary results, so I'm sorry. Yeah, it's I'm very preliminary. So <laughs> yeah, many, many things are very not. Settled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I see. Uh, so, so I have given uh, motivation from some explicit computation, but uh, I also want to some give a more abstract motivation why this may work. So, and uh, here I want to talk about anomaly stuff. And in 4D, so in 4D amuse, we know that, so at least for example, in large N analysis, so ground state energy, ground state energy, as a function of theta. So, so partition function of SUN amuse should be to by periodic in theta, but uh, we know that uh, it, uh, so each of the vacuum does not have a good 
uh, to buy periodicity, but uh, there are many vacuum and at C type of pi, there should be a level crossing between one vacuum to the another. And for example, in monopole condensing scenario, then this uh, first vacuum, zero vacuum is due to monopole condensation. And for example, other vacuum can be understood as a consequence of the ion condensation. And because of the Coulomb energy out of electric Coulomb energy and, with, and introducing the Witten effect of the monopole and the dion, this kind of level crossing can be naively understood. And in more recent field theoretic understanding, so this can be understood as a two pi periodicity. of theta and times the N1 form symmetry is Tofuta anomalous. So one way to say it is this monopole vacuum into, with the introduction of the Tofuta flux has a trivial phase, but for the ion condensing vacuum with Tofuta flux, it has a non-trivial it has, uh, so it contains some non-trivial topological action for the partition function. And because of the difference between as an SPT state for, with one form symmetry, this monopole and the ion vacua uh, should be distinguished. And or more explicitly, we, so, if we compute a partition function at set equal two pi with the introduction of the uh, Tofuft background, then we can compute that theta of pi is equal to. And uh, this, uh, this has an anomal, this is nothing but the anomalous phase. Of theta periodicity when Tofuft background P is inserted. And we want to say, and I want to claim that so this anomaly found by Guy Otto, Kapustin, and Komargotsky and Cyborg is uh, so, so still exist, so still survives after 2D compactification with Tofuft flux. So how we can see it then? So, so let me start with a naive case. Then, so B field is basically a, a two form gauge field with some discrete flux. And we can understand that so B and let's say M2 times T2, and this one is small, and this direction and the third and four directions. And this is basically one, two direction. And, and if, if I write down the component, this part is a background, this part is a gauge field for the N1 form symmetry in 2D. But for example, if we consider B13 of dx1 times dx3, then this contains, a, for example, third compactified direction. So, so it should be better understood as a, so Zn zero form gauge field. And it is coupled to Poincare dual of S1 along the third direction. And there are many other terms, something like this. And, and if we compute B with B for this M2 times T2, then so it 
takes this kind of form. So B1. So first it contains B1 to B3 fold term. But uh, since this direction, so third and fourth direction are both compactified, this is now zero because we do not introduce any background flux. So as a consequence, this B1 to B3 fold part is equal to zero. But for example, there is other term, something like this B2 fold. And this part is, you can say that this is a U1 or GN one form gauge field acting on third Polyakov group. And this can be now understood. So, so by integrating out this kind of X3 and X4, this can be now understood as a, a uh, so this D, B24 is a second component of the, uh, the one form gauge field acting on the, acting on force Polyakov group. So this tells you that, so if we introduce, so in 2D, we have GN one form symmetry times GN zero form, two GN zero form symmetry. And let's now introduce, so this two dimensional background gauge field, let's say A3 and A4, then with introduction of these background, in this 2D and co compute the partition function at C take or two pi, then what you get is something like N over two pi. Like this. So indeed, so there is still a Tofuft anomaly including the theta periodicity and some of the gauge field. And but uh, so what we have learned is so so for the so theta periodicity in with uh, or for this theta periodicity anomaly. So originally this requires that so, e, so confining vacuum of theta of two pi is not equal to, does not, each of them does not have a two pi periodicity. But uh, in this 2D trivial compactification, So anomaly matching claims that the theta periodicity is uh, so, so violated or spontaneously broken or GN zero form symmetry uh, is spontaneously broken. And uh, we have already seen that uh, anomaly matching is uh, so crushed. Our weak coupling analysis suggests that this is realized. So this spontaneous breaking of the zero form symmetry is sufficient to match the fifth anomaly. So this is sufficient matching. And as a consequence, with a trivial to torus compactification. So as we have seen that there is no candidate of the theta angle because the 2D PIR mu theory doesn't have theta. And, and relatedly, this theta periodicity of vacuum is very trivial. So each vacuum has a trivial, so or each vacuum is a trivially C to by periodic in theta, but, uh, but there are many vacua vibrating zero form center symmetry. But now story is completely different if we introduce Tofuft flux, so to the compactification with. Julia, just a quick question. Yes. I mean, so that means that, uh, I didn't realize this before, but it means that if you, if you 
for example, introduce some uh, trace deformations uh, mm -hmm. and, and preserve the zero form symmetries, you would still have a very similar story, right? I think so, right, right. Even without introducing the flux. Do you know what happens when you add uh, uh, adjoint fermions and uh, make uh, things, uh, do they introduce some GPY potential which could maybe uh, mm -hmm. force the EM zero forms to not to be spontaneously broken, even in 2D? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I do not know. Yeah, Let's it see. would require this GPY potential, right? Which we uh, uh, to be computed in the presence of fermions. Right, right. And uh, I actually didn't understand when you were talking about the GPY potential. Uh, what was the, you said that they commute that the two holonomies commute between themselves, but. I didn't understand that part. Was that an assumption or was it true? Yeah, just... that's an assumption by solving the classical part, reading classical part, yeah. Right. Uh... Yeah, so I, I do not that... know what happens if we force the non-trivial holonomy by introducing double, for example, double torus deformation. Well, yeah. I think by anomaly, you, you should get a very similar story. Um, yeah, I think so, yeah. But, but it would be nice to have something which dynamically does that. Uh, mm. In any case, that, that, I didn't mean to stop you. I was just curious if you- if Yeah, you... that's an interesting point, yeah, thanks. Okay, now let me go into to the compactification with the first flux. Now, I important you. point. Sorry, Yuya, can I, no, no, can I stop you before you get there? Um, when in the trivial case, you have this broken zero form symmetry, there are many vacuoles yes. you mentioned. There are also kinks between those vacuoles, which must appear as solitonic particles in your theory. There is, a, is there some kink? Let's see. Um, let's see. Um, but I do, but uh, I think that part, even there is some kink. So, are you talking about kink of the effective potential or? Let's... I'm not sure the effective potential is valid everywhere along the trajectory, but if you have in vacuum or if you have a spontaneously broken. Zn, there's surely kinks between them. Yeah, so Gn is broken, so at least there, there should be n vacua, I guess. And uh, let's see, maybe n squared, yeah. And kink config, yeah. But I, I think since that spontaneous breaking is already suggested uh, as a classical level. And uh, since, yeah, as long as that uh, tension of the kink configuration, so domain wall configuration is sufficiently large, then there is no sufficient entropy factor because of the, in, in 2D. So I, I think that uh, breaking of the GN zero form symmetry is very manifest, at least in some parameter region. Oh, I agree, it won't, they won't change the ground state, but they may have interesting dynamics, in particular that the fact that there was an anomaly of the ZN may, may mean there's something novel about the way they, they behave. Um, let's see. But uh, this anomaly, let's see. Yeah, of course, this anomaly is RG invariant, but uh, so it, it's just said that, so let's see, does it say something? Yeah, I'm not sure, let's see. So in some cases, uh, we can say that the, so in, in some cases, anomaly tells you that different, uh, so different domain uh, 
indeed different SPT states, so there should be some local excitation appear, should appear on the kink. But in this case, this anomaly is a triple mixed anomaly. So theta angle periodicity and two G and zero form symmetries. So I, didn't, I don't think this kind of anomaly suggests that different domain should be different SPT states. So those kinks are dynamically allowed and I think they, those domain walls can be very trivial. I see, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems to me from the anomaly that what, what the anomaly is saying is that the intersection of the two domain walls will be a fractional instant on. Um, let's see. Because when you put the background, uh, I see, I see. Maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah. So, so that's what the so the, this fractional vort vortex is basically, you know, an intersection of two heavy domain walls. That's why it doesn't condense in the vacuum uh, and 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 create this fractional um, theta dependence because it it requires the main walls which are heavy. I see, I see. Uh, but in any case, uh, because we're, I, 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 I would love to discuss more, but I, I don't know how much more you have, and we are slowly running out of time. But leave yeah, to okay. <laughs> uh, in, in, okay, okay. Right. Yeah, but um, we are almost, we are close to final. So in this case, so this part is now two pi i over n. So so this b one b two so. So now this term also survives. So we get this. And uh, as a consequence, so in this case, theta plus two pi over B and A3 and A4 is now given by E of I times Yeah, so we get this anomaly. And so in this case, anomaly matching claims that so again, it is okay that theta periodicity is violated. Or both GN one form and GN zero form. Are broken. So point is, so now we are this set of periodicity has a mixed anomaly or between GN one form and also has an independent mixed anomaly between two G and zero form symmetry. So if so, so if one of them is unbroken, then theta periodicity must be fractionalized. So that is a point. And very natural scenario is if both G and zero form and GN and and if either of one form symmetry or zero form symmetries are unbroken, then sheet of periodicity of the vacuum has to be fractionalized. And our semi classical analysis suggests that so, so GN0, at least GN0 form is unbroken, and very likely due to center vortex. The N1 form is also restored by center vortex. And, and according to semi classical analysis, we, we know that the theta periodicity should be fractionalized for the vacuum. And, and the very concrete scenario is suggested that, that again, so if we have a to center vortex configuration, which has a one intersection point in four space-time dimension, then that 
intersection point really has a fractional theta dependence. So in order to have fractional theta dependence, this center vortex is again a natural scenario. And if those center vortex really appears, then the, that's the end of the form, one form symmetry is also restored. So at least it, it is self-consistent within that story. So basically this is what I wanted to tell. And um, very briefly, if we introduce fermions, then, then for example, if we consider two torus compactification with Tofufto flux, then if we have a center vortex, then this has a fractional theta dependence or, or i.e. in other words, Q topological is one over N. And so if we have this kind of center vortex configuration, then so if we consider an index of the Dirac operator or a number of fermionic zero modes, it, is, it should be proportional to basically Q topological. So number of fermionic zero modes should be fractionalized. And in order to have this kind of fractional zero mode, there are two interesting possibilities. So one of them is just having a joint fermion. And in this case, so index of the adjoint is 2n times q topological. So this is nothing but two. So this suggests that if we have a vortex type, a center vortex type proliferation, then that center vortex amplitude is something like E of S vortex times some lambda lambda, some uh, so if we add a joint fermion lambda, then it is, should be associated with two fermionic zero mode. And by having this vertex, then it is natural to have a non-zero expectation value of a, group, uh, a joint fermion. So uh, discrete chiral symmetry of a joint fermion is likely to be spontaneously broken if, it is, if those center vortex is really proliferated. And again, so it's also related to the set angle periodicity anomaly. And in this case, we also have a mixed anomaly between the N1 form symmetry and the discrete chiral symmetry in four dimension. But in the same logic, just I explained here, so that anomaly is still survives even in this 2D compactification. And as long as those zero form and one form symmetries are unbroken, again, that discrete chiral symmetry have to be broken in order to match anomaly. And this center vortex scenario seems to give a natural minimal explanation for realizing the minimal possible breaking of discrete chiral symmetry breaking. And another thing is what happens if we have a fundamental fermion? Then with fundamental fermion, so because fundamental quark can see whether has a mutual statistic between center vortex surfaces. So we usually say that with fundamental excitation, we cannot introduce a foot flux background. But still it is possible, but if we have U1 baryon symmetry, So this is nothing but the U1 quark symmetry divided by Zn. And, and because of this fractionalization, so if we want to introduce minimal baryon magnetic flux along this tofu, uh, along this two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional compactification, this says that for quark, so this is a baryon gauge field, baryon number gauge field. But in terms of a quark number gauge field, it is fractional and it doesn't accept the Dirac quantization. But this violation of the Dirac quantization is related to the violation of the Dirac quantization 
in color sector by having this non trivial transition function or non trivial to fifth loop along compactified three, uh, three and fourth direction. And these, non, these ambiguity can cancel out. So by inserting uh, baryon number gauge field with minimal Dirac flag, uh, so with minimal Dirac quantization, then even with the introduction of the fundamental fermion, so this logic of the confinement seems to still work. And in this case, so I have not still finished what happens with fundamental fermion, but what is expected is with this triangle U1B, SUN left, SUN left anomaly. So by 2D compactification with introduction of the minimal, minimal magnet, uh, baryon flux, then we now have this 2D SUN left, SUN left chiral anomaly. So it is likely that so by having this confinement, low energy EFT seems to become SUN, or oh, sorry, SUNF versus Minowitte model to match this kind of anomaly. And, and, and this, this is very similar to, and from in the, language of the Masonic field, this is very similar to the chiral effective Lagrangian of the 4D chiral symmetry broken phase. So maybe this is a key to understand the chiral symmetry breaking of 4D gauge theory with this two torus compactification. But this part is very, yeah, really optimistic and this very, very unsettled. But the point is center vortex scenario may be able to provide some semi, semi-classical understanding of this specific to torus compactification setup. And I hope that this is useful to understand a new aspect of the confinement and the chiral symmetry breaking. Yeah, that's everything. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Yuya. Ken. Uh, any questions? Uwe has unmuted, so I, I think he. No, no, I, I was just too late now, too late, too, too late to clap, so I'm, I just wanted to clap. <laughs> Are there any um, questions? Yeah, any more questions for you? Yeah. A concern, Yuya, which is, is, is related to the issue of whether this semi classical configuration exists for the, for the center vortex. So suppose we do the following, we, we take your two large space-time dimensions and we compactify mm -hmm. them on a big torus. Then you can put a top flux through that torus in exactly the same way as you did through the, the small torus. And presumably that carries the right quantum numbers to be a center vortex, is, is that right? I think so, uh, right. So yeah, so maybe just uh, minimizing the classical action with that setup, maybe we can find the, the explicit classical, semi classical configuration. But my, my concern. Yeah, is that's that one hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the action of a top flux presumably is proportional to the area of the torus. E, let's see. And so as you go back to flat space, the action becomes infinity and, and your e to the minus s vault, which sticks everywhere, is zero. Uh, I see. Mm. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, that, yeah, in that case, uh, yeah, story, yeah, this story doesn't work, but uh, at least uh, According, yeah, of course, uh, it is very difficult to construct a BPS solution with the in introduction of the non trivial topological flux. But uh, if uh, we have a non trivial, so if we have a crash cause or a, almost a BPS type solution, then minimal lower, so minimal, so minimal lower bound of the 
classical action is really given by one over G squared times uh, Q topological. And so it is basically given by eight pi over G squared N. And at least with small T3 compactification with large S1 with some several introduction of the first fluxes, such kind of configuration seems to exist according to, for example, uh, lattice numerical study of Gonzalez Arroyo or his student Montel, or another recent paper by Esco Ito also suggests that such configuration seems to exist at, at least when all T3 is small and with two torus. And, and among those small T3, we introduce one. To, so when we introduce one minimal to first flux, then it seems that some classical solution or, or, or low, lower bound of the BP, lower BPA, yeah, BPS bound seems to be saturated. So I hope that that uh, body uh, or area so large action proportional to area does not occur because some, according to those lattice studies. But uh, of course, I have no proof, so still I'm working on it. it. It would be very interesting to find these localized solutions in the continuum. I, I think there can't be a BPS bound because the BPS bounds are always bounded by the integral of some topological charge. But mm -hmm. the sets of vortices, there's, there's no way to express the charge as the integral of some local function. Um, but it's not clear whether it cannot be because, for example, there's a paper by Tofurt in which if we have a very specific aspect ratio of four torus, then we can really construct the BPS bound. We can really construct some classical, uh, uh, classical gauge field configuration satisfying a BPS bound with a fractional topological charge. So, it's a very subtle, not trivial question whether such configuration exists for general for torus. But uh, I hope that uh, such configuration still exists. Yeah. But, but that, that's just a hope. Is it important that it's BPS? I don't think so, right? It may not be BPS. It may not be BPS as long as it exists. I think it's not important that it's BPS. Uh, yeah, it's not that important, but the uh, classical action has, does not have to be proportional to area or something. It has to be just constant, yeah. Uh, but as long as that condition is satisfied, everything works very nice. And uh, BPS is just the simplest candidate, but uh, even if that such kind of solution doesn't exist, as long as uh, S vortex is still finite or does not proportional to space-time volume, then yeah, everything should work fine. I'm just curious, uh, well, it's a question for David, but the, why, why do you think that it would be proportional to area? There's, uh, is there a reason to think? I, I, that would... wrong, I, thought, I thought the action of the standard top flux was proportional to area because they're just constant. But I, th I think the point is that you go to a Higgs regime where you really don't want any gauge fields. And, and this Toft flux, uh, you, you know, in continuum, we like to think of it as uniform flux, but you see on the lattice that you can actually put it at any lattice site. And it's it's really some kind of like a boundary condition. Through. Well, then, then you have the opposite problem is you, you don't want it to be proportional to the UV cutoff either. <laughs> uh, but that's a gauge choice where you put it. You can just- On, on, on the lattice you're fine, but on the continuum, you, you really don't want this to be a thing that becomes singular. No, of course not. I, I think I'm saying the singularity is just a lattice artifact. It's a it's, sorry, it's a gauge artifact. It's like a putting a, a co-cycle condition in continuum. In any case, it. Uh, uh, yeah. Maybe we can discuss it uh, less formally. Uh, yeah. Just one comment is so at least uh, there's a. I think the paper by Van Baal explicitly, explicitly shows that as long as uh, so, so into the first flux does not have a uh, non-trivial topological charge. So as, as long as the integration of VHB is equal to zero, then there's a twist eating configuration, which makes Yami's action is really 
equal to zero. So at least even if we insert the top of lags, that does not necessarily so immediately introduces any energy or action density. So, so we, we can make, yeah, by, by having, by considering, okay. by having a nice uh, gauge field configuration, sometimes we can make action very, very small. Yeah, just one, one more comment is that, I mean, you would naively expect as you said, right? I mean, the the the, the one form uh, uh, symmetries uh, should break into the. I mean, that's the expectation. Not like in quantum mechanics that you have an expectation that ordinary symmetries always uh, are. Uh, sorry, uh, should always be restored, right? That's yes, issue. yes, yes. Exactly. Never break. Uh, I said. It. Uh, so, so although that is not always true, in particular, it can uh, it need not be true when you have anomalies. It is a natural expectation, I would say, that you have these vortex vortex effects. So that's just yes, a yes. So that's one of the reason why I'm very optimistic in this <laughs> computation. Yeah, yeah. It would be nice if we have very explicit construction of those vortices, but uh, I, be, I still believe that uh, exactly because of the reason you mentioned, yeah, okay. I expect that anyway, the N1 form symmetry should be restored. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, comment what about the kinks that David asked for that uh, connected the, when, when you have the ZN0 form symmetry breaking, in the trivial case, without the, the flux, right? And, and you expect to have some kinks connected between them, and they should carry this mixed uh, A3 wedge and for anomaly. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's very simple to get to get it. You just take the young Mills domain one, which is U11N, Chern Simons, to three dimensions, compact mm -hmm. it, right? you get two scalars on the torus, phi one and D phi two. And there are two ZN. Uh, symmetries, which one of them, but there, there's a mixed anomaly between them, like a particle on the surface. So it's uh, a your anomaly, your A3 wedge, A4 anomaly. I'm there. I'm having a bit of trouble hearing you. I don't know whether you uh, can hear everything you said. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I think so. Yeah. Indeed, in four-dimensional case, yeah, we have a boundary chan Simon theory because of the anomaly. If we have a domain wall of the theta zero and two pi, and exactly because of this anomaly, yeah. So first of all, let's see. Yeah, because of this one-form symmetry, so one-form background electric flux should be different between them. So electric charges should be surrounded in one of the uh, in one of the vacuum and on the other side there should be no such thing and uh, furthermore because of this uh, s3 which a four time so there is a so each bound so, so each boundary state should have a, uh and, and uh, yeah state and, and so it, it, so at least on at one side of the vacuum should have, a, if we put a system with boundaries, there should be N degeneracy, but on the other yeah. side, there should be no. And this is, and I think this is also consistent with the compactification out of the Chan Simons coupling. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, just giving you the domain, I think the, the domain theory. You can get it quite easily from the. Yeah, from yes, the yes, yes. So, so this boundary. Theory should be also a minimal theory expected from the compactification of Jan Simon's term. And um, yeah, I, I think uh, that can be explicitly checked to out. So if we can explicitly check those things also from the semiconductor computation, then that's very promising. Yeah. Um, the the center plays a particular role in your investigations. Now, a long time ago, we uh, studied G2 gauge theories, which mm -hmm. don't have a center. 
and yeah. uh, we found this interesting to explore. It still has monopoles, it still has instantons and theta uh, vacua. Um, with your techniques, would it be interesting to look at G2 gauge theories? So unfortunately, no, because uh, so so interesting thing happened because we can introduce the fifth flux uh, that is possible only if uh, gauge group has a center. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, in the case of G two, there is no center. So so what we can do for this two torus compactification is, is only a trivial. To, to reveal flags. So with that small T2, so everything is, uh, yeah. So we, yeah, e everything becomes trivial. So because e each Polyakov loop becomes uh, th this kind of a trivial, becomes trivial compact trivial theory. And also, yeah, so re resultant theory would be just a two dimensional G2 Yamil, pure G2 Yamil theory. So, so perturbative Coulomb interaction is already just confining. So yeah, <laughs> so unfortunately in the case of G, G2 or not with trivial center, I cannot do much interesting for this. <laughs> for this okay, thing. all right, yeah. thanks. This is my uh, ignorance, uh, but uh, does G2 even have a multi-branch structure? I, is there any evidence that it does? So at least in uh, super, N equal one super amuse, uh, so chiral symmetry breaking is proportional to second Casimir. So, so at least uh, with small from small deformation of uh, super amuse suggests that there is a multi-branch structure. But uh, it's not required by any anomaly or something. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and uh, pure amuse, uh, honestly, I think no one really knows that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Yuya, I was supposed to, <laughs> and, and I started chatting with Sinyaki. Hi, uh, okay. thank you. Very yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you for, for your talk. It was, it was uh, uh, great. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. So we have a discussion session with you a little bit later for people who would watch your video between now and later, which by experience is not many people, but maybe somebody who watched it will still have questions. If not, we can chat about other things. I see, um, I see. So thank you very much and uh, uh, we'll see you soon. Uh, yeah, see you soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Yeah, there's no abuse ratio. Right? So SUN, you get M plus one.